With all the talk of the brand new M1 Pro MacBooks, I want to make one thing clear. If you are looking for the lightest, best value, most powerful Ultrabook that you can get for the money, you should still buy the M1 MacBook Air even over those bigger, more expensive MacBooks. So why is that? Let's find out. It's so satisfying when it slams. What's up everyone, I'm the Everyday Dad, and if I can figure it out, you can figure it out. Yes, I made almost this exact video three months ago, but since that video came out, we've now seen with our very eyes what a pro-level M1 version of a MacBook looks like. Yes, it looks very, very good, but it's also very, very expensive. And yes, there will be a You Should Buy video on those. They are absolutely amazing and absolutely worth it to certain folks. But I see a ton of FOMO, or fear of missing out online, from folks that recently bought one of the new M1 chips. And since this is kind of an ancillary You Should Buy video, I want to make a couple of points up front. One, I bought this myself. I will never make a You Should Buy video on something that I haven't personally purchased. And two, no, I don't want you to actually go out and buy everything in this series. I think of this series in two parts. One, yes, it channels my excitement about a new piece of technology. But two, it's really out there to help confirm and to help you feel a little more secure in your purchases because there's so much negativity out there. So this is clearly, if you just bought an M1 MacBook Air and you're scared about, should I have spent triple the money on like a fully upgraded MacBook Pro 14? Well, this is the video for you. No kidding, I think there's a very strong argument to make that if you are looking to buy a laptop, especially if you don't need all of that power, this is the best option for you out there. We've talked about the specs and price of this machine a ton so far in previous videos, so I'm not going to bore you with that today. If you really want to see all the upgradability options and all of the prices, if you look at my channel for any amount of time, I'm sure you can easily find one. I just want to quickly cover three topics on why with the new MacBooks out, maybe one of the best laptops ever made, is still a pretty good option. You know, maybe, maybe just a little bit. First, let's talk about power, because while yes, the two lines of regular Macs and quote-unquote pro-level Macs diverge in the power output, it's not really as wild as you might think. Unless you spend all of that money on the M1 Max, then yes, it's pretty wildly different, but that puts you in a whole different price category that we will talk about later. If you are somebody that is just looking for a regular old day-to-day -day computer to do regular old day-to-day -day tasks like working from home, or as a student that really just needs to take notes and write papers, there isn't a benefit in going for that full-blown power option of the M1 Pros. Yes, they are objectively more powerful in power tasks, as we can see here. Even the 8-core M1 Pro scores very well against the 8-core M1 standard that we've got in my MacBook Air. But in actual use, you will not be able to tell that much of a difference because of how well Mac OS works with its efficiency cores. These M1 processors are built into power cores and efficiency cores, and everything will feel faster and smoother on any of the new M1 Macs because the way the ARM-based Mac OS is set up, programs load almost instantly, and having the stronger of the power cores doesn't really affect that kind of use in really any meaningful way. Plus, if you do need to do some power tasks like video editing or other creative enterprises here on youtube.com or other creative outlets, the M1 MacBook Air will still be one of the most efficient and powerful options on the market. I spent the last year using the 8-core M1 standard to run my whole YouTube channel, and it was the best experience I've thus far had in all of the computers that I've ever used to manage this channel. I cannot overstate how good the last year has been because of how smooth my M1 MacBook Air and Mac Mini operate. Yes, my M1 Max MacBook Pro 16 makes everything faster, but the overall use hasn't changed. Like it still feels just as fast and just as good to use both computers because of those efficiency cores. And if you were looking for a gaming machine, neither the M1 Standard or the M1 Pros are really a great option, so that's not really a reason to get one over the other. One thing that I do want to note that doesn't really fit in anywhere else, but it's kind of related to power, is that if you were looking for one of the longest life computers you were going to find, the MacBook Air gets crazy battery life. Yes, the M1 Pros get pretty good too, but I find that the more powerful you go, the less length of power you actually get. They're still very good in battery life, but something about the M1 regular computers is they just feel like they never lose charge. I've gone days without needing to charge this MacBook, and it just, it always seems to have battery life. The next reason to continue buying the MacBook Air over those bigger, meaner machines is portability. Now, when I say portability, I'm using that to mean both usability and more of like how easy it is to carry around. Just because something is small doesn't mean that it's always the most portable. Yeah, 
I'm good at this deep thinking stuff. The MacBook Air, even with all of that power, is also one of the most practical small laptops that you can get. Yes, I will easily give the M1 Pro MacBooks a huge boon in those additional ports they have. Those are amazing and by themselves could be a reason to buy those. But the MacBook Air is also one of the smallest, slimmest laptops you'll ever find. And the fact that you get all of that power and all of that battery life in this tiny little laptop, I mean, look at this thing. That's still one of the shocking things that I've seen in the whole laptop market to this day. Normally in a laptop, there are three things I look for, power, portability, and price. Coincidentally, those are the three things we're talking about today. But normally, you have to pick two of those. Let's say you want a small, inexpensive laptop. Well, it's generally not gonna be very powerful. You want a powerful, portable laptop. Well, it's not gonna be very friendly to the old wallet. Oh, you want an inexpensive, powerful laptop. Well, then it's gonna be pretty darn big and heavy. The MacBook Air hits each of these. It's like the unicorn of the computing world. I've never before seen a laptop that is at once able to hit all three of those laptop metrics. And team, I'm telling you, I know you've heard me say this several times before, but it bears repeating because of how often I get asked, both in the comments here and on Twitter, about if the MacBook Air is still good and worth buying. This is so good. One ding against the MacBook Air for portability is you will need a dongle or adapter if you need to do anything that isn't strictly USB-C or Thunderbolt. And yes, that sucks. It doesn't kind of suck. It absolutely sucks. But it's really the only problem here. And for the money you save here, you can afford triple redundancy of whatever dongle you want because this thing costs less than half of what the bigger MacBooks cost. And lastly, we're talking about price. The last thing that really brings this all together is that price. Look, I like the new MacBook Pro 14 and I love my MacBook Pro 16, but those computers are very expensive. The cheapest model of the MacBook Pro 14 is $2,000. That's more than some of the whole ecosystems we've built in previous videos. Yes, it will eventually come out on the refurbished store, but even then, it'll probably only drop by $150 or $200. So it will still be twice as much money as the M1 MacBook Air. But at the retail price, you can get the MacBook Air, AirPods Pro, and an iPhone SE. That's a whole ecosystem. You can get that for around $1,400, fam. That stuff is buck wild. A whole ecosystem that doesn't really skimp on too much for less than the cost of a single laptop. You might be worried that a computer that costs so much less than its siblings had to cut corners in the construction of said computer. And no, they didn't here. They get around a lot of that by using the same chassis from previous generations. It's all metal. The keyboard continues to be one of the best in the business. You don't have to deal with the touch bar. The display... It's okay, it's not great. It's probably one of the weakest aspects of the MacBook Air, I mean, it's right up there with the port selection. But it's not like the plastic gaming laptops that have all of their production budget spent only on the internals. This thing is built like a tank and will be able to do so much and work in so many spaces because of how it's built. And even though it's the cheapest laptop, it's dead silent. The computer doesn't even have a fan, like what? All computers have fans. All the other MacBooks have fans. All the Windows laptops have fans. This one doesn't, and it's a testament to how efficiently running the M1 standard processor is. I've never had a thermal problem here. Yes, it gets warm, sometimes it gets hot. And yes, if you actively try to make it overheat, you can, but why would you actively try to do that? If you are a regular person doing regular person computing tasks, you'll never, ever reach the thermal limits of this computer. There are a small amount of upgrades you can pay for here as well. You can go to a two terabyte solid state drive and 16 gigabytes of unified memory. It's not a lot, but it's not nothing either. But if we were gonna start upgrading, that puts you in line with the MacBook Pro 14. And if you are pushing towards $2,000, I'm definitely gonna recommend you move over to that. The real value in the MacBook Air is in how cheap you can get it, and you can buy it refurbished from Apple for less than new, but it still gets treated like new. Holy crap, it's so good. I could and have talked about how good this is for hours at a time. But at the end of the day, so what, right? Obviously, this is the third time I've recommended you buy the MacBook Air. I've never, ever done that with a computer or or anything else before, and I'm not sure that I'll ever do it again. This computer is lightning in a bottle, and I don't know that we'll ever see such an amazing jump forward in technology, or at least we won't see it for a while. It's not just a single advancement. It wasn't just the battery life that got better. It wasn't just the power that got better. It wasn't just the thermal performance that got better. It's the triple threat where everything got better all at once by leaps and bounds, and I don't know that we're gonna see something like that again. This computer by itself changed what we should expect from small Ultrabooks, 
abuse, and I feel totally vindicated in my previous video saying that this would hold the budget crown. This would hold the regular person's crown no matter what else Apple came out with in their bigger pro laptops. I will continue to highly recommend the MacBook Air to almost everybody because it's not a niche computer. It's a computer that huge swaths of folks could easily get the most out of and you can save a ton of money at the same time. But if you are interested in those MacBook Pros and you do need a little more power, some folks do need more power, and you're a little more curious in seeing a video about that, well, good news, right here is my video about one week later with the MacBook Pro 14. It can take you all through the things of what I liked and disliked, and you can find it by clicking right here. Click, 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 click. Thanks for watching.